So I'm going to get started because I've got a longer lecture today. So we were talking about surgical treatment of ocular surface disorders. And these are the procedures I'll be going over. I'll be spending a little more time on um, limbal uh, stem cell transplantation, kind of more about the background rather than just the surgical procedure. Um, so first, conjunctival biopsy. This is pretty straightforward. Um, so is this helpful for diagnosing a conjunctival tumors for the most part, such as CIN um, or pigmented lesions? But it's also useful in diagnosing uh, conditions such as ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, um, where you do need some immunofluorescent staining to diagnose. Um, so typically, if there's a, like a discrete lesion, you do want to mark the borders, um, even if it is obvious, because once you um, inject some subconjunctival lidocaine, that can obscure um, the borders. If you are very suspicious for melanoma, uh, the books talk about a very wide margin, like four millimeter uh, wide margin with a no-touch technique uh, to remove suspicious uh, lesions suspicious for melanoma. Um, and anytime there's any sort of suspicious lesion, whether it's CIN, um, usually it's kind of CIN related, I will perform uh, cryotherapy of the cut conjunctival edge after the lesion's removed. Um, and there's uh, something called a double freeze thaw technique, which I'll just show a few seconds of. Um, or basically, you use a cryoprobe to um, freeze off an area of the conj edge and then um, kind of go on to the second section, kind of just barely overlapping what had just been frozen. Um, and so the purpose of this is to freeze off any um, possible areas of um, uh, any suspicious cells that may be beyond that cut edge. And so you just kind of keep going around, you know, once, and then you go around one more time just to make sure you got everything. So that's enough of that. All right, any questions on conjunctival biopsies? Um, next, we'll talk about tarsorophy. Um, so this is for non-healing epithelial defects um, that fail other treatments, and other treatments being lubrication, bandage contact lenses, or even Procara. Uh, you might also do a tarsorphy in the absence of an epithelial defect if, if there's ophthalmos and a high chance for recurrent epi defects. And tarsorphies can be temporary or permanent. Um, and uh, the permanent tarsorphies, you do have to take off the... Um, kind of the lid margin epithelium to get the lid margins to stay together. And tarsorophies can be um, medial, central, or temporal um, in the lids. And tarsorophies are usually performed with suture. Um, like I mentioned, they can be temporary or permanent. Um, you can also do something called a glue tarsorophy where you use cyanoacrylate glue to literally kind of glue the eye lashes together. Um, that's usually very temporary. Um, I might resort to this if there was some reason why I wasn't able to suture, maybe because of patient um, movement issues and kind of, uh, kind of if you're doing this at the bedside, you, you could do a glue tarsorophy. Um, and then there's Botox tarsorophy where you inject Botox into um, the lid to drop, to basically cause atosis, um, which is nice, but just know that that does last three months. Uh, but uh, can be an effective technique. Uh, next, we'll talk about pterygium excision. And um, the indications for removing a pterygium are kind of listed here. So one is the most obvious one, any progressive growth towards the visual axis. Um, if you've got a pterygium which is causing decreased vision or significant astigmatism, um, or you, know, you may have a relatively small pterygium, but if it's causing persistent redness and discomfort that's not relieved by topical drops, uh, that would be an indication for a pterygium excision. Can we shut the door and just make sure it's unlocked on the other side too? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so here's an example of a, a pterygium that is causing flattening on topography in this area. So it's going to flatten here and it can cause some astigmatism 90 degrees away. Um, when removing a, t a pterygium, it's important to remove the underlying tenons layer, not just the conjunctiva. Um, and you want to always send the uh, specimens to path, um, just because I've uh, come across the occasional 
pterygium that's turned out to be CIN. Um, there are a few techniques of, about what to do afterwards. Um, there's bare sclera, which we don't recommend because there's a very high recurrence rate. So ju that just means removing the pterygium and just leaving everything bare. So super, super high recurrence rate. It's like at least 50%. Um, you could do a primary closure of that um, defect with suture, um, but that can be difficult if it's rather large. Um, so if it's a really teeny tiny pterygium, I might consider a uh, primary closure, but typically, I will use um, a conjunctival autograft, which is a, I guess you could call it like a conjunctival transplantation, where you take the conjunctiva, usually from the superior bulbar conge, um, and apply it to the defect. Um, you could also cover the defect with amniotic membrane. And conjunctival autograft is my preferred technique because it has the lowest rate of recurrence, um, about 2 to 5 percent. And also, it has the best cosmetic result, um, I think even better than amniotic membrane. And um, so again, free graft from the superior bulbar conjunctiva. Um, you leave that superior conjunctival defect open, that can kind of heal in um, just primarily. And then to stick that autograph down, I will apply some fibrin glue, such as to seal. Um, and I might, I usually put down a couple uh, dissolvable sutures as well. And it's important to seal the graft, the conjunctival graft to the conjunctival edge um, so that um, you kind of decrease rate of scarring and recurrence. Uh, amniotic membrane I'll use if the superior conjunctiva is not available for a graft. Like there's, let's say there's a lot of scarring, there's a trab there, or let's say you've got a nasal and a temporal pterygium at the same time. And so I've, I'll typically harvest the uh, superior, superior graft for the larger pterygium and then use amniotic membrane of the other pterygium. And just like with um, conjunctival autografts, you can secure the amniotic membrane down with fibrin glue or sutures. Um, I'll use mitomycin C intraoperatively if I'm taking a patient back for a reop pterygium, um, and this is to prevent recurrence. So after the pterygiums are removed, I'll so have some soaked sponges of mitomycin C tucked underneath the conjunctival edge for a couple minutes, and then rinse off really well, and then move forward with either conjunctival autograft or uh, amniotic membrane. Um, with a, with um, any use of mitomycin, there's always a concern for long-term complications. Um, scleral melt and infectious scleritis are two uh, which are possible. Okay, so next I'm going to go to limbal stem cell deficiency, which will be kind of next several slides. And limbal stem cell deficiency may be partial or complete. And typically on exam, you'll see conjunctivalization of the cornea. Um, you'll see a uh, thickened, vascularized, um, irregular surface, kind of an irregular epithelium. Uh, there may be chronic inflammation. Um, there can be persistent epithelial defects, stromal ulceration, scarring, or even corneal perforation. Um, so here's an example of, I'd say, probably near total limbal stem cell deficiency. There might be some semi-healthy limbus down here, but um, there's extensive neovascularization as well as scarring. Um, here's another example of probably, this is 360, uh, limbal stem cell deficiency, and this is an example of 360 um, limbal stem cell deficiency with stromal ulceration and, and probably a epithelial defect there. Um, so stem cells are cells that are defined by the capacity for unlimited or prolonged self-renewal to produce at least one type of highly differentiated uh, progeny, and they're defined by their niche um, where there's contact with surrounding cells. Um, there are um, interactions of those cells with the extracellular matrix as well as local growth factors. Um, and stem cells are a major target of gene therapies um, to change um, entire cell populations. And limbal stem cells are not embryonic stem cells. Um, so this is kind of a little diagram showing the limbus being the border between the conjunctival and the cornea. And so the limbal stem cells or the corneal stem cells reside here, and they are um, able to regenerate uh, corneal cells. Um, when you have limbal stem cell deficiency and you get conjunctivalization, there's actually goblet cells within the conjunctiva, um, which are visible um, on pathology. These kind of bright magenta dots are the goblet cells that are seen within the conjunctiva. 
Um, I think this is showing an epithelial defect, and this is showing kind of the edge of some irregular um, epithelium that you can see, um, which you'll see with limbal stem cell deficiency. So there are many causes of limbal cell, stem cell deficiency. They can be congenital, traumatic, iatrogenic, autoimmune, neoplastic, or idiopathic. And so we'll go over all the causes. Um, the most common congenital cause is aniridia. So aniridia you know, means no iris, but it's more than just that. Uh, patients who have aniridia do have a pretty profound limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, other congenital causes include ectodermal dysplasia and uh, keratitis ichthyosis deafness syndrome. Um, there are several causes of traumatic limbal stem cell deficiency, chemical injury and thermal injury are one. Um, contact lenses can actually induce um, a slow limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, a severe infection that extends to the limbus could kill off limbal stem cells. Uh, neurotrophic keratopathy can lead to limbal stem cell deficiency, as well as even chronic bolus keratopathy. Um, the, if you have someone with a chemical injury, the prognosis depends on the extent of ocular surface involved, and more particularly, the amount of limbal ischemia. Um, so there is um, a table here called the Roper Hall Classification sin, uh, System, which kind of predicts prognosis based on the amount of limbal ischemia uh, from grade one to four. Um, and this is kind of the, what you'll see typically on corneal exam. Um, so here's an example of an acid burn. There's maybe some limbal stem cell deficiency. You have some vessels, so it's not a complete limbal stem cell deficiency here, but it's just a little bit maybe wider than we would like. Um, the cornea is a little bit hazy, um, but it's clear enough where you could see the iris. So I would probably classify this as maybe a grade two. Um, here's an example of kind of more severe um, limbal stem cell deficiency where you see some whiteness, but there is um, there's good um, vascular blood supply here. Um, let me just show you an example. It's a lot more obvious. So this is an example of acute um, limbal stem cell uh, deficiency from alkali burn. So it's just really, really white. So it's very, very striking when you see complete um, limbal stem cell deficiency. This is, so this is an important finding to see, like when you're on call and you have someone who's admitted with burns, or if you're on consult service and you're consulted to the burn unit, you do want to look for this finding. Um, very striking, kind of later on, subacutely. You see everything around is pretty red, and then this area is just kind of dead. Um, this is an example of, yeah, pretty severe limbal stem cell deficiency. You can see the whitening kind of around here and a very, very opaque cornea. So this is a poor prognosis. Uh, moving on to the next uh, category of limbal stem cell deficiency causes, um, iatrogenic um, can occur with uh, multiple eye surgeries, um, which involve the limbus, which can kill off limbal stem cells or multiple cryotherapies to the limbus. Um, Long-term topical medications, like some um, glaucoma medications with um, a lot of preservatives can lead to limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, use of 5-FU or mitomycin can also kill off limbal stem cells as well as radiation. Um, autoimmune, we've got many causes here, including SJS, Cicatricia pemphigoid, um, any sort of chronic lumbitis from ATP or uh, limbal vernal, um, as well as a uh, Murren's ulcer um, can lead to limbal stem cell deficiency. Uh, neoplastic, um, a pterygium is kind of a very focal um, uh, limbal stem cell deficiency, um, as well as CIN and other um, neoplasias on the limbus can lead to uh, stem cell deficiency. And then lastly, there's always idiopathic as being a kind of an unknown cause. Um, with transplantation of um, the ocular surface or with limbal stem cells, there's kind of different classifications. We've got autografts, um, which use autologous tissue, which is harvested from the same or fellow eye, and allografts, um, which are, are typically harvested from um, cadaver eyes, um, or can be harvested from a living relative uh, with um, HLA matching. Um, and here are 
kind of the, here's kind of the alphabet soup of some of the more common uh, limbal stem cell um, transplants that are done. There's a uh, conjunctival limbal autograft or uh, CLAU where the fellow eye is used um, to transplant uh, limbal stem cells. There's living related conjunctival limbal allografts. Um, there's keratolimbal limbal allografts. These are from categoric uh, donors. Um, so that's a KLAL or a KLAL. Um, these last two are not um, performed in the US, but these are um, using kind of um, taking limbal stem cells and expanding them in the lab and then um, transplanting back in either from a fellow eye or a living um, related relative. Um, so this is kind of the basics of what's done. Um, pa the, the patient is, has their kind of abnormal limbal tissue removed, um, and then there's a donor from cadaver or fellow eye or a relative um, where sections of uh, limbus are sutured on. And that's kind of the basics of limbal stem cell transplantation. Um, with uh, the conjunctival limbal autographs from the same patient, um, this is indicated in unilateral limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, or there can be um, kind of a primary unilateral limbal surgery, so a pterygium with a uh, conjunctival autograft is technically a conjunctival limbal autograft, or CLAU. No one ever calls it that. We just call it a trigium excision with a conjunctival autograft, but it's technically a limbal stem cell transplant. Um, let's see. We've got, um, yeah, so source from the same eye or uninfected fellow eye, and you can take up to six clock hours of donor tissue um, from the healthy fellow eye without um, much risk. Um, the nice thing about um, same patient limbal stem cell transplant is there's not going to be graft rejection, so you don't need to have any sort of systemic immunosuppression. Um, living related conjunctival limbo autographs are um, indicated in bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency, um, again, a source from a living related donor with um, an optimal HLA match. Um, you still do need systemic immunosuppression. Um, and having a living related donor can improve the prognosis over a cadaveric donor. Um, so what's done, this is the, I guess, living related donor where sections of um, conjunctiva are harvested. This is the recipient where the bed is kind of all cleared, the vascular panis over the epithelium is removed, and then these sections here are sutured down. Here and there. Excellent. Yeah. Do the donors have any trouble with like healing if they get um, epithelial defects and things like that? Um, I don't think so. Not if you take less than six then six clock hours. Yeah. So, I mean, they lose some limbal stem cells, but I, I don't think you get. Um, I guess you, you technically have a partial limbal stem cell deficiency, but the rest of the limbus can um, heal over. Um, so this is a picture showing. Um, harvesting of this section of limbus. Um, KLALs, these are um, limbal stem cell transplants from cadaveric donors. Um, so again, indicated in usually bilateral disease. Um, systemic immunosuppression is required. Um, and usually kind of we do the uh, limbal stem cell transplant first and then see whether or not a PK is needed later. Um, and so doing the limbal stem cell transplant will improve the prognosis over just doing a PK primarily without a stem cell transplant. Um, so again, this uh, allows for healing of persistent epithelial defects, um, stabilizes the ocular surface and can cause regression of neovascularization and chronic inflammation. Um, so this is one technique, so you can mark the recipient conjunctiva first, just to get the borders there, um, then peel off the vascular panis, seen here. Um, so then you've got a clear bed of kind of taken off all the corneal epithelium and kind of cleared off the limbal area there. Um, and then you have um, cadaveric um, corneal scleral rim. You punch out like a 7.5 millimeter 
um, opening in the middle. Um, and then you want to uh, take off the posterior two-thirds um, of the donor, so you have just the superficial one-third to use. Um, and so this is kind of a diagram here showing what's done. And you typically do need three halves just because things kind of stretch out. So you do need two rims typically, um, but you're using three halves. Um, and then this is showing the three sections here. So even though they're halves, when you kind of stretch them out, two halves don't really cover one eye. So you do need three sections. Um, and these are, these sections are all sutured down. Um, and this is showing a post-surgical, I think, not immediately but post-op, but uh, post-surgical section where you can see a suture holding down a section of uh, limbus here. Um, and I think this is showing that there are some sutures immediately after. Um, so it's kind of a mess afterwards, but um, kind of give things time to heal and then see how much the cornea can clear afterwards. Okay. All right. Um, this is a procedure I'm just putting one slide in on. Um, it's kind of a newer procedure called simple limbal epithelial transplantation or SLET. Um, so instead of harvesting these big chunks of limbal tissue, you actually take um, a small chunk of limbal tissue that's like literally two millimeters long and cut it up into little pieces. And that small amount of limbal tissue can come from patient's fellow eye or it can come from, I suppose, uh, cadaveric tissue. Um, so you take these little chunks of limbal tissue and you take the patient, de their cornea, put on amniotic membrane, sprinkle, like literally sprinkle these pieces of limbal tissue on um, used to seal the glue them down and put another layer of amniotic membrane. So the thought is the little pieces of limbal tissue can um, kind of propagate around and heal on the surface of the eye. Um, I haven't done this. I've heard that the results can be good, but may not be quite as good as a traditional uh, limbal stem cell transplant surgery. Um, okay, lastly, kind of a few slides on um, ex vivo stem cell expansion. So this is not something that's available in the US, um, but what's done is um, stem cells are actually kind of grown on a carrier of amniotic membrane. Um, and amniotic membrane, again, is from the innermost layer of the placenta. It's an epithelial monolayer with a thick basement membrane. It's non-immunogenic and there's no systemic immunosuppression required with amniotic membrane. Um, so there's limbal stem cells that are placed on the amniotic membrane and are kind of grown on top, and then that tissue is transplanted into a, a recipient. Um, but again, not available in the US, but I think they're doing it in Japan. Uh, Postoperatively, after a limbal stem cell transplant, um, you want to use topical medications, topical steroids. Um, you can also consider topical cyclosporin. You want to uh, really lubricate the surface of the eye as much as you can with punctal occlusion, lots of artificial tears. You might consider a tersorophy. Um, and then you may plan on a subsequent penetrating PK um, at least, I think at least three months um, after a limbal stem cell transplant. And systemic immunosuppression does need to be um, employed um, for at least 12 to 18 months. Um, there are a few, I guess, systemic um, immunosuppression regimens that are used. Um, so topical steroids are always used. Um, and then you can consider either uh, systemic cyclosporin or tacrolimus and also azathioprine or mycophenolate. Um, so that's limbal stem cell transplants. Any questions thus far? Okay. Um, next, we'll talk about uh, keratoprosthesis. Um, so this is also used in cases of limbal stem cell failure. Um, also used when there has been multiple uh, PK graft rejections. It's kind of a surgery of last resort um, because there are complications such as glaucoma and infection that can be difficult to control. 
Um, so the Boston Curator prosthesis is what's typically used. Um, there's an older design, which we'll go over first, because then I'll kind of translate what the newer design is. So with the older design, there was a front kind of plastic window to look through, and that goes th gets thread to kind of a donut punch of a corneal graft. There was a PMMA backplate, and then everything locked together um, with a titanium locking ring. And this would be assembled kind of outside the eye, and then it's sutured into the eye by suturing the corneal graft um, to the patient. So it's kind of like a PK, but it's got extra literal hardware attached to it. Um, now there's a newer design of the Boston K-Pro, it's called the click-on design, where there's still a front plastic optic and it's still threaded through a corneal graft, but instead of a kind of two portions here, the back plate here is made of titanium. And then the back plate kind of has a way of locking in place so you don't need a separate locking ring. So it's a little easier to um, put together. Um, and the thought is that the titanium may have less of a risk for devel the development of retrocorneal membranes, which can occur, um, especially with the PMMA design. I think this, that finding has yet to be proven, um, but that's kind of the impetus for the development of the newer type of Boston character prosthesis. Um, so this is what these look like. This is the older PMMA version, and this is the newer titanium version, which because it's titanium, it's a lot more um, visible um, than with PMMA, which is clear. Yeah. What is the purpose of the corneal graft in these? Um, so the purpose of the corneal graft is literally a carrier to suture something into the cornea. Um, so. Um, that's kind of the purpose. And then the cornea is just left, it's vascularized in. Um, so this is one that's kind of been vascularized in. So all that's left that the patient can look through is the middle um, PMMA clear optic window. Um, the holes that are here, and there's kind of little holes that you can see here, that, that's just um, allowing for nutrition, nutrients to kind of flow in and out. Um, so that's the purpose of that. So the holes are not really, we're not using the holes to pass the sutures through. They're just there. Um, the sutures are only going through the cornea. Um, so that's keratoprosthesis. prosthesis. Yeah. If you have a keratoprosthesis prosthesis and it fails, is it possible to go back and do a PK after that? Uh-huh. usually do it after a PK, but... Yeah, no, you can go back. So you can, I mean, I didn't go into all the complications of... Capro, I mean, I mentioned glaucoma and infection, but um, extrusion of the curator prosthesis is also something that can happen. So if there's an issue where the capro just can't be retained, then it can be explanted and then just do a regular PK, which will probably fail, but, um, you know, at least keeps the eye intact. Um, next, a uh, conjunctival flap. So this is for, so this is like Gunderson flaps. Um, this is for a, either like a chronic sterile ulcer, um, patient with maybe very painful bullet with poor visual potential, um, or an unstable cornea, such as um, progressive thinning. It's not used for corneal perforation. Um, it can be a partial flap versus a complete, a complete flap, which is a Gunderson flap, and I'll go over what this is. Um, you do need to take off the entire corneal epithelium to get the conjunctival flap to stick on. So it's literally used to cover the cornea, um, but it is going to, because the conjunctiva is semi opaque, it decreases vision, but it's kind of like almost like a last resort, like just something to cover the cornea because nothing else is working. Um, so this is a schematic of a Gunderson flap. So what you do is you go way back, like 14 millimeters behind the limbus, up superiorly, and incise the conjunctiva. Um, you try and leave tenons behind, so you're just separating conjunctiva from tenons, and you kind of make a big dissection all the way around. Um, you have to do a 360 degree pyridomy, so all the way around here. And then after that's done, and there's more dissection that has to happen all around, you slide this section kind of down over the cornea, and then this is sutured down in this fashion. So it completely covers the cornea, and this is meant to be a permanent thing. 
um, would be really hard to reverse, I suppose. I, um, I mean, I've done a PK on top of, kind of through a Gunderson flap, unknowingly. Um, but uh, that's kind of what a Gunderson flap is. So it's a pretty bloody, cornea surgery-wise, kind of a bloody surgery, um, just because you have to dissect um, kind of a very large area subconjunctivally and kind of put this over the whole cornea. Um, Mucous membrane grafting, so this is for the reconstruction of conjunctival mucosa in inactive cicatricial conjunctival disease, such as Stevens-Johnson syndrome or um, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, and it achieves a better ocular surface um, lubrication by improving tear film distribution and eyelid movement. Um, this would be something that's partnered up with uh, typically plastics. Um, the buccal mucosa is usually used um, it's nice that you have a nice kind of new ocular surface, but it does not replace stem cells. So it's not for limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, next, we'll talk about um, amniotic membrane transplantation for severe SJS. Um, and hopefully you guys have the, this is available, I believe, on the resident um, box file. Um, so this is kind of the, um, the chart that we use to decide whether or not a patient with S acute SJS needs amniotic membrane transplantation. So if you look, you have to look at the lid margin, cornea, and conjunctiva. So whether or not there's staining, you know, the, the degree of staining of the lid margin will dictate um, whether or not an amniotic membrane transplant needs to be performed. Also, if there's any staining of the cornea, that would um, lead to um, surgical um, treatment. Um, sorry, let me go back here. Um, do need to look at the conjunctiva and palpebral conjunctiva also for staining defects. Um, if there, I guess, is less than, basically if there's less than one-third staining of the lid margin, no staining on the cornea, and kind of small staining on the conjunctiva, we can go medical. Any more than that, you want to do um, amniotic membrane transplant. Um, so the technique is you take a large, the largest piece of amniotic membrane, which is a five by five centimeter piece, and you cut it in half, um, trim the patient's lashes to the base, and then you suture the amniotic membrane kind of anterior to the lash line with a running suture, and then you tuck in the amniotic membrane kind of under the lid, and then secure um, the amniotic membrane to the lid with 6-O-proline that goes in the fornices and suture it to bolsters. So that's what these are. These are 6-O-prolines going through the lid. Um, so then you have the upper lid, do the upper lid, do the lower lid, um, and then to cover the cornea, um, place a procura, which is amniotic membrane that's attached to a uh, kind of a hard plastic ring. And so that's what's done in the OR. Um, this might be my last procedure. Um, superficial keratectomy. Um, this is a simple removal of the corneal epithelium without replacing it with anything. So uh, we might do that. Um, I mean, I, I guess we kind of do that with the pterygium surgery. We're not replacing the pterygium tissue off the cornea with anything, even though we're, you know, doing a conjunctival autograft on the conj. Um, but you can do that with Salzman nodule. You just peel off the nodule, let things heal in. Um, epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, so taking off the abnormal epithelium, um, letting that heal in. Um, very, very superficial kind of epithelial scar scarring. You could do a superficial keratectomy. Um, if there is suspected corneal CIN, um, you can send the epithelium off to pathology. Um, let's see, you can also, oh yeah, if there's a retained um, superficial foreign body, that technically is, uh, and you're removing that, that technically could be a superficial keratectomy. Um, manual superficial keratectomy is performed with a blade. Um, you can also peel it off with forceps. And then afterwards, you can consider kind of polishing down um, the epithelial basement membrane with diamond burr, uh, which I'll use um, in the case of recurrent erosion syndrome. And I'm taking off kind of loose epithelium due to diamond burr polishing of the base. So the hope is that what heals over can heal over a bit more smoothly. Um, you can do a laser superficial keratectomy, which is called a PTK or phototherapeutic keratectomy. 
Um, and this is where the eczema laser, so the eczema laser is used with LASIK and PRK. The eczema laser is used to ablate tissue, not for the purpose of correcting refractive error, but for um, kind of removing um, abnormal epithelium as well as kind of abnormal anterior stroma. Um, our laser here doesn't have a PTK setting. So what we do is we'll typically just do PRK. So we're programming in some sort of refractive error correction for the purpose of PTK. Um, but there's another laser that's commonly used called the Visix laser um, made by AMO, which has a, a PTK setting. And what that means is instead of having, um, with PRK, there's tiny little spots that we use to ablate tiny little areas um, of the corneal stroma with um, PTK setting, it's just one large diameter, like a 6.5 millimeter diameter of laser beam that's used to just ablate away tissue. Um, so PTK is used to smooth superficial anterior stromal irregularities. Uh, the problem though is that scar tissue can ablate differently than normal tissue and can result in an uneven surface. So if you're using like actual PTK and you're doing large diameter um, laser ablation, what you have to do is, because you've got this irregular kind of stromal surface, you use what's called a masking agent, which is typically like a kind of a artificial tear with a little bit of viscosity, like Refresh Plus, apply a thin layer so it fills in all the valleys of your irregular stromal tissue, um, and then you can use PTK to kind of ablate off the peaks. Um, you can do PTK in um, granular dystrophy. Um, it can take off, it's not gonna take off all the chunks of um, abnormal um, uh, tissue with granular dystrophy, but it can take off kind of the anterior uh, portion and smooth that out. Um, it's been used with post lasix 3 a um, PTK is not good for anything deeper than 100 microns though, because you don't wanna ablate so much tissue that there's kind of not much left. Um, it may not work as well in post herpetic scars or traumatic scars, um, but PTK is an option for kind of very superficial pathologies. And that's it. Any questions? Yeah. I feel like on call in the acute setting, when we have these patients whose lids, their skin is sloughing and they're so inflamed and in pain, um, it's kind of hard to flip the lids and get a good assessment of uh, the conge underneath. What yeah. are your suggestions for how to do So that? I don't think you necessarily need to like flip the upper lids. Um, but you can do sweeping with a, a cotton tip. And if you have like pseudomembranes coming off, like that's not normal, so that would be What about it's like no, when sloughing. it's not an SJS patient? So okay. I think like uh, we'll see the burn patients and then we'll see um, like the pemphigoid patients. And okay. uh, I guess the purpose is to assess how much um, like how pubertal conge is involved and okay. like the extent of disease. Is it yeah. important to get a good look under there or not really? I would say that's not as important. Okay. I mean, because with cicatrice, well, with cicatrice of pemphigoid, you can look at the fornices. Um, you'll see if there's some blepharon formation. And you can tell that just even by like, you know, raising up the eyelid, you can tell. Like if you like Sometimes you have the lid kind of scarred down where you can't raise it, mm -hmm. and you know, okay, there's gotta be some blepharon down there kind of tacking the lid down, even if you can't see it. Um, with burns, I mean, you can tell just by looking at the palpebral um, conjunctiva. Um, I don't think you need to know like how much tarsal um, epi defects there are. I think that's more important with SJS, and even with SJS, you can tell by sweeping the, the fornices. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, well, I guess that is it. Um.